a light went off inside me when I realized that. And without any words spoken, there is no need to preach a sermon, Lord. Just show me that symbol. And I know what the covenant of marriage is all about. Make no mistake about it. You were born to be a true millennial. All right, welcome to True Millennial. I am here with my wife, Lexi Walbeck, and we have a special guest today with us through Zoom, Bryce Dumford. Bryce, thanks for coming on. I'm honored. So quick introduction of why we have Bryce on. Uh, my wife and I stumbled across his, he has a YouTube channel. He does a podcast with Mike Day. It's an amazing podcast called Talking Scriptures. They together are a very dynamic duo. Highly recommend checking out that podcast, but he also has a personal YouTube channel. And on that channel, I stumbled across this amazing series that he dives into temple symbols. And this is kind of a taboo topic that we don't hear a lot about. And so I had to get him on. I had to discuss it. My wife and I found it and we both just, our minds have been opened, exploding, excited to learn about these temple symbols. And so Bryce, uh, by trade, you are a seminary and institute teacher, correct? That's correct. Uh, 31 years now. And where do you currently teach at? I'm at the Jordan campus of uh, Salt Lake Community College in, in West Jordan. Very cool. And if you don't mind me asking, what inspired you to start putting yourself out on the internet in the first place with Mike Day and then doing your own channel here with the Temple Symbols? Well, I've always wanted to, I've always felt like one of the great barriers for young single adults today is accessibility, is they have limited opportunities to come to us. And so I've always felt like if there's any way I could go to them I would love to do it. But we've never really opened that door until COVID hit. And then when COVID hit, we, we had to. We had to put our classes online. We had to teach online. And that just kind of opened the door to say, look, how many people from all over would, would love to have access to you know, in gospel instruction? And so I just kind of kept that up. And I would I, when I was transferred to uh, one of my, my current assignment, I went to my director and said, what if we offered some strictly online courses? And just as an experiment, let's see. Let's see what happens. Let's see what, you know, what the what the reception is. And so that's when we just started to record classes and make them available on a YouTube channel. And I I, I truly believe that scripture that says there are many who are kept from the truth because they know not where to find it. And I didn't want to be one of those that didn't make every effort in the, uh, that I could to make it available so that they knew where to find it. And the other thing, there was so much negativity, so many negative things being said about the church and about the restoration. I just wanted to do all that I could to just say, here is truth and let's let's get it out there. Let's get our message out so people can hear it. Um, and this is a great medium to do it. I love it. And I appreciate you sharing that. And that's a message that I'm trying to always get out as well as you don't have to be an institute or seminary teacher to put out your testimony and, and to just uh, counterbalance all the negativity that's out there. There's a lot of us who are silently just living our lives, loving the gospel. And we're kind of in an era where we need to be able to use these tools to share what we know and love. And so I appreciate what you're doing. Appreciate your boldness to put yourself out there. And we'll leave links in the description below for his podcast, for the uh, the Temple Symbols class that we're going to be discussing today. Um, but Bryce, we want to focus today's discussion on Temple Symbols. And we have a ton of questions for Bryce, stuff that we'd love for him to explain and, and to talk about in detail. We only have about an hour. And so you're going to have to check out the full series that we'll link below. But we'll give you kind of a preview so you can know why we love it so much and, and give you some awesome insights today. So we'll kind of go in order. Bryce has 20 episodes he's done. And we're just going to kind of pull out some of the ones that stood out to us that we, we think will be uh, universally relevant to a lot of people. But one of the first ones was in episodes five and seven, Bryce talks about the symbol of baptism being spiritual rebirth, which we, we kind of know that generally in and out of the church, that that's a pretty commonly known symbol of what baptism is. But what a lot of us don't understand, both out and inside the church, are what the ordinances we do inside the temple, what symbolism those have, and how they relate to and tie into and build upon the 
ordinance of baptism, and you explained that really well. So I'll just let you kind of go off and, and explain the, the anointing, the washing, the clothing and the garment, the new, getting a new name. What, why are we doing that? And how does that relate to our spiritual rebirth of baptism? I, the idea that Jesus teaches Nicodemus and that we talk about it in the gospel a lot is that baptism is that rebirth. You know, we don't, the, the token of baptism isn't to wash our hands underneath water, which would point out a cleansing. The token of baptism is to be buried and then come back out in a newness of life, which is a death and a burial. So if you picture that newborn baby, and I just barely had two grandchildren come into this world, and I just, that newborn baby right out of the womb, newly born, covered in blood, covered in all of the amniotic fluid. And I asked a simple question, what would you do first to that baby? What do we do in all of our hospitals whenever a baby's born, What do we do first? Well, the first thing we do is we wash that baby. So it shouldn't surprise us that the very first thing we do in a temple ceremonially is we wash that reborn baby. And it's symbolic washing, and it's a specific washing, but it shouldn't surprise us that a newborn baby gets washed. And so as we come into that temple to grow up, as the Lord says in section 109, The first thing is we're going to be washed. Then I love to point out that if this were a royal baby, whenever a royal child is born, they immediately anoint the child upon birth as this is someone destined to be the ruler. And we need to recognize that. We need to recognize that this one is so special. And the, the child needs to grow up knowing that I have to live up to that. And so the second thing we would do would be anoint. Um, I always point to Simba in the Walt Disney. As soon as Simba's born, the, the moment he's born, there's Rafiki anointing him because he's the mm-hmm. future king. So we're washed and then we're anointed. And then I ask, what else would you do? What would you do? What happens to a brand new baby after they're washed clean? We clothe them. Yep. And then very shortly thereafter, we name them. So it shouldn't surprise us if, (laughs) as we move into the temple, having been reborn through baptism, we are washed, clothed, anointed, and given a new name. And boy, that's the symbolism of coming right into the temple. I love that. And it, it sounds so simple when you say it, but I think there's a lot of members of the church that don't even know what we're doing there. It's just, oh, this is a weird practice <laughs> that, you know, was Joseph Smith started or whatever, but it's actually pretty very simple. That specific teaching for me just really brought the whole temple to life. And I loved it because it, it helps me also recognize I'm an infant in this spiritual journey, you know, and this first time in the temple, it's like, I'm a new baby and it's going to take a lifetime of learning and growing and stumbling and progression in order to ultimately, you know, realize the potential that we are anointed for, you know, in that beginning. And so I just thought that was such a beautiful symbol because it really brings home that journey for each of us. And another I thing I it. love is it puts it puts Heavenly Father kind of in that role that we need to see. He's not a distant God. He's Father. She's Mother. And mm-hmm. I'm infant. Mm-hmm. And I go to their mm-hmm. home to be raised in their home under their care like that child. And all of a sudden, that becomes a very real image that I am a child of Heavenly Parents who are very involved in my life and are watching and comforting and loving. And the whole point of the temple is to end up in their presence. And so I just really like that idea of seeing me as a newborn, rewashed child in their care. Yeah. And you explained it beautifully. And again, he, he goes into detail on all of these. But again, I, I just love that that tie into Simba. That's a really you know popular movie that we can look at and say, oh, I get that. But the idea is that we are destined to be kings and queens, that we are children of the Most High God, and that what we are going through in the temple is symbolism for 
us coming into the presence of God and obtaining all he has and becoming kings and queens ourselves. And so treating that those temple ordinances for what they are, which is us preparing to become kings and queens. So let's move on to uh, episode six. At one point in the presentation of the endowment, we put on these aprons. A f- it symbolizes fig leaves. And we're asked to remove and to replace with coats of skins. So we have the, in the presentation of the endowment, we have these putting on, taking off, replacing articles of clothing. And for somebody who's going through the temple for the first time, they're thinking, what, what is this? What is going on? Can you talk a little bit about what these pieces of clothing represent and the deeper meaning behind what we're doing in that putting on, taking off, replacing of these articles of clothing? There's an odd verse at the very end of Moses chapter 3 that says that Adam and Eve were naked and unashamed. Um, The man and the woman were naked and unashamed. And so you have to pause and say, okay, let me see that symbolically. Their nakedness is a symbol of the parts of my life that I'd like to keep private. There are many things that just aren't everyone else's business. But Adam and Eve were naked and unashamed. There was nothing in their life that they needed to hide from anyone, from each other, from God, from their neighbors. And then they transgress. And as soon as they transgress, they are no longer naked and unashamed. There's something they very much want to hide from God. And I don't want anyone to see this. And so the scriptures say that they gathered fig leaves to cover themselves. So they they covered their mistake. And I would suggest that that suggests that fig leaves represent all the things we do to hide ourselves, hide ourselves from God, hide ourselves from other people. Sometimes husbands hide things from their spouse or wives hide things from their husbands or we hide them from our bishop or we hide them from God. And those are the fig leaves of our life. And I love the very next verse and the very next verse of Moses 4 when the fig leaves don't seem to be enough. And I love the symbolism of the fact that fig leaves don't adequately cover me. Mm -hmm. Think about that when you're in a sacred place, that this is not a good covering. Why why do I think that this (laughs) is going to cover me? It's not an adequate covering. And so Adam and Eve, when when the fig leaves don't seem to be working, they hide among the trees. So bigger leaves, bigger things to hide. And then in Alma, it suggested in the latter days, men's sins would be so great that they will want mountains to hide upon, uh, to fall upon them. All of these things seem to represent what I want to do to hide myself from God. Sometimes I just stop talking to him as a fig leaf. I don't want to face yeah. this. Or sometimes I, I cover my sins with darkness or a closed door. There's lots of fig leaves. They take lots of of form. But it's only when Adam and Eve seem to realize, you know what, this is not what I want to do. I don't want to hide from God. And they come forward and they say, "I, I did eat. And they're vulnerable and they expose themselves and they say to Heavenly Father, I made a mistake. And I'm not going to hide it anymore. And I, let's talk about this and let's, let's deal with this. And can you help me? And at that moment, Heavenly Father coats them with a coat of skins. Now, again, this is not in scripture. But again, let me ponder the symbolism. Where would Heavenly Father have found coats of skins to cover them? He had to have killed an animal. Mm -hmm. And I often ask, what animal was most likely, again, again, I'm not pointing to a verse in scriptures, but what animal is it most likely that he would have killed to cover Adam and Eve? And I love to point to a lamb. And then all of a sudden the bells start to ring and people start to wait. Oh my goodness, now I see it. What he covered them with when they took their fig leaves off, what he covered them with was the atoning sacrifice of Christ. And that covering is much bigger, much more expansive, and will not come off. So I love in sacred places to compare the covering I use to cover myself and his covering. 
But one thing to ponder, people say, well, why do we put it back on? If it's something negative, why do we put it back on and carry it into the Father's yeah. presence? And, and I would ask you to listen carefully because what I'm asked to do is remove and replace it. It's not the same thing I put back on. It's not. It may look like the same article of clothing, but symbolically, it's not the same thing I took off. I'm being asked to take off what I use to cover myself and replace it with what he has given me to cover myself. Now, I know you're saying, well, that's two things that point to Jesus. And I say, yeah, everything <laughs> points to Jesus. So what was pointing to my mistakes and uh, uh, my fig leaves, when I put it back on, it's now a symbol of uh, his atonement. As are the coats of skins, as are robes, all of it is pointing to Christ. But again, it's not the same thing I put back on that I take off. Thank you for explaining that. Yeah, I think for a lot of members and even for a lot of years for me, it was just like, this is just what you do in, in the temple and you don't really think about it. And the, what I love about your series is it makes you think about it. Like, let's think about what we're actually doing. And like you say, how does this relate to Jesus Christ? You know, there, there's a lot we're doing in all these little small details that there are symbols behind all of that. And, and that's what I love that you're pointing out through this whole series. Anything to add, Lex? Okay, we'll move on to the next one here. So a, a big, uh, a popular debate, I guess you could say, in our, in our modern day is the roles of men and women. And you do a good job of, of talking about the symbolism of Adam and Eve. So this is, and this is just for reference, if anyone wants to go and find more in detail on these topics, episode nine, Bryce talks about Adam and Eve. They're a big part of this presentation of the endowment that we do. And we're told at one point to consider ourselves as if we are Adam and Eve. So we, we know that's a pretty obvious symbol, that Adam and Eve are a symbol of us as husband and wife as we come to make these covenants. But you make an argument that that's not the only symbol of Adam and Eve. There's some obvious ways in which that makes sense, but there are some times where uh, critics will, or even people who are looking for it, will find things that don't necessarily fit into that narrative of Adam and Eve in the way that they're presented in this presentation. And you make the argument that at times Adam and Eve can be a symbol like the, like the scriptures often do, where they put the man as Christ and the woman as the church, all of us. Or the scriptures oftentimes will use the, the bride and the groom, right? How we are the bride preparing for the groom, Christ. So talk a little bit about some of those instances where maybe this presentation of the endowment isn't referring to just a, a, a woman being submissive to her, her husband, but maybe it's actually pointing us to us being submissive to Jesus Christ. If you go back to the Old Testament and the New Testament, that was such familiar symbolism. The Lord uses that all the time, that, that the church is the bride. Do you remember when the prophet Hosea was asked to marry a prostitute? That is a symbol that Christ, the faithful husband, is married to an unfaithful wife. And that's very common symbolism, is that Christ is our Redeemer, he's the husband, and the church is the bride. And when she's a faithful bride, he's there, he protects her. But when she is an unfaithful wife, when she has an, an, another man, another God in her life, then the church is, is, is betraying him. That's very common symbolism. And it struck me over the years, um, ever since I was endowed way back in 1987, I've noticed that a lot of people have found issue and found fault with when a female in the church or in the endowment does something that the male doesn't do or vice versa. And, and sometimes we interpret that as, as sexism. And so I, mm -hmm. I, I kind of began to say, I know God isn't sexist and I know his endowment is not sexist. And I know Joseph wasn't. And I know that 
So there's got to be another explanation as to why one does something that the other doesn't do and seems yeah. to create an inequality between man and woman. And then I connected that idea from the Old Testament and the New Testament that Christ is the man and the church is the woman. So one day when I was asked to con consider myself Adam and Eve, the, the natural assumption is that men are Adam and women are Eve. But, but one day yeah. I sat through there and I said, now, wait a minute, I'm going to look at the whole rest of this. Everything we do from here on out, I'm going to consider myself Eve. And I'm going to look at the Savior as Adam. And it just completely opened up the rest of the presentation to me. And it helped me see any time that what, there was an apparent inequality between the man and the woman, it, it was a better description of Christ and the church. Because yeah. that inequality we fully accept. And as far as me and Christ, I love how Neil A. Maxwell said it. He said, any assessment we make to see where we stand next to Christ tells us we don't stand, we kneel. Yes. And in that, in, you know, in that relationship, Christ and his bride, we are not equals. Um, I love that idea that as his bride, as, as the wife, I am very, very submissive to him. I don't consider us on equal terms. And so as I began to see quite often when we make the assumption that Adam is the male and Eve is the female, and it seems something's not right here. I have found great insight in taking those moments and looking at Adam as Christ and Eve as the church. And I am Eve in that circumstance. And then I'm asking myself, OK, so what's the covenant here? What's the teaching? What's the application here for Eve? That's me and he, yeah. Christ, is Adam. And it completely changes how you view those things. I love that. And in the next episode, episode 10, Bryce goes into the symbolism of the rib that is taken from Adam. And talk a little bit, kind of along these same lines, talk about why it's significant, in your opinion, that... Eve was taken from a rib, and what? why is a rib significant? I was teaching in a rural area, and uh, over the course of the year, I watched so many divorces. And I watched um, the devastation in the lives of the teenager, my student, when their parents divorced. And, and sometimes it was because of infidelity. And in frustration, one day I asked myself, I asked the Lord, where is it that you put the model of marriage? Because if you do a quick scan in your mind of the Book of Mormon, marriage is not really a subject of the Book of Mormon. Yeah. I mean, I can say, well, okay, Lehi and his wife, and there's a small letter. In, in, but marriage really is not a subject of the Book of Mormon. So I began to say, well, wait a minute. Where does God show his children how to be married? Of all the, of, of all the subjects, that one ought to have a prominent place. And it, I don't find it in the Book of Mormon. I don't find it in the Doctrine and Covenants. There's a, right. a, a, there's a reference here and a reference there. But where is the model, Lord? And then it just hit me like a ton of bricks. Of course, he put it in the most obvious place. And I asked my, I told myself, if he had put it in the Book of Mormon, it would only be accessible to Latter-day Saints. Yeah. If he had put it in the New Testament, it would only be acceptable, accessible to Christians. Mm -hmm. So, of course, God teaches how to be a husband and wife in the very creation of the earth with Adam and Eve. And to me, that's the symbol of symbolism of Eve, and be, Eve being taken from a rib. If you read the previous chapter, Eve's there. Moses chapter 2 ends with Eve there. The Lord commanded them to multiply and replenish the earth in chapter 2. And, and he wouldn't have said that without Eve there. So Moses 3 has to be commentary on the world that the Lord just created. And so if I asked myself, okay, so what's the commentary here? And what's the symbolism of Eve being taken from the rib? And what I share in the video is are, are three very important ones to me. Number one, if Eve had been taken from Adam's foot, where would that have placed his wife? And you and I, all of us know men that put their wives below them, that trample on their wife and treat right. them like a play toy. 
And that mm-hmm. is not where God placed her. Nor did he place, nor did he take Eve from his skull, and that placed her above. And there are some, even men, who place their wife above them. Yeah. And there are some women who place themselves above their men. God didn't take Eve from in front of Adam or behind. It was not his intention that the man leads her and that mm-hmm. she follows, nor it was it his intention. As sometimes we see some men say, well, you you go do the religious thing. You go do the church thing, and I'll just kind of follow your lead. That was never the Lord's intention. It was always side by side. And so I asked myself, everything I do, is that placing my wife at my side or somewhere Mm -hmm. else? And it's a great check for me. Everything I do, everything I say, however I treat her, is she at my side? Are we side by side on this? And my second that I bring up in the video is that my rib cage is a cage to protect my heart. And for me, that is the most important message I have been given on how to be her husband. That my wife lovingly placed her hands, her vulnerable heart, in my hands when we married. Mm -hmm. She is so vulnerable. No one loves her like I do, but no one could hurt her like I could. And that was an act of trust to place her heart in my hands. And I consider it my greatest responsibility to protect that heart and to keep it safe. And I would say... It is my responsibility to share my heart with her. Sometimes men have this idea that I can't be vulnerable. I can't talk to my wife about my fears and my concerns. But I think that's that's what God's trying to teach here is that I protect her heart and she protects mine. I think he's trying to say, Bryce, there shouldn't be anyone else out there with whom you share intimate details of your life more yeah. than you share with her. She is your partner and your confidant. And you need to make yourself vulnerable to her just like she makes herself vulnerable to you. It's when we both are protectors of each other's hearts that I think we're standing side by side. And the third one we talk about in the video is that nothing's closer to my heart than my ribs. And I'm fascinated mm-hmm. by the command, the two great commandments. Thou shalt love the Lord with all thy heart and love thy neighbor as thyself. That's a different level of love. God, all my heart, my neighbor as myself. But then in the restoration, in the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord takes one of these neighbors and bumps it up to this level of love. Yeah. Because in our day, I have been commanded to love my wife with all my heart. So I love that symbolism of the rib pointing out at my side, a protection of my heart, and I protect hers and then closest to my heart more than anything else. I love that. It's beautiful. Yeah. I I love Bryce that in a world of uh, ideologies and ideas being thrown out about, like you talk about the church being oppressive or sexist, if we are willing to look deep enough into the symbols of what the scriptures and the temple teaches us, instead of being offended by it, we'll actually be enlightened by it. And we will see that the Lord is, is so much more equal than any of the ideas the world can feed us. But we have to be looking for it. If we're looking for inequality in the temple, we'll find it. If we're looking for perfect equality that the Lord is trying to teach us in the temple, we'll also find it. And I love that you have found it and are sharing with us and inviting us to go and find it. Something that Bryce mentions at the beginning that really gave me quite a bit of hope was just that we can all learn to speak this language of symbols. And to be like, to be very honest, I have been going to the temple for 10 years and never understood or given much thought or unwrapped many of the things that he discusses in his series. And I just thought, you know, that's something I don't understand. I can't grasp, you know, I don't know anything about, I'm not a scholar. I'm not capable of 
unwrapping these symbols. And since watch, watching your series, you just encouraged everyone that anyone can understand this, you know, and learn this and know this for themselves if you seek. And in doing that, I have really had so many things unfolded to my mind and heart in that experience and just have had my own witness that, oh, I can learn <laughs> these things and the Lord is willing to make them known unto me as I search and ponder and pray, you know, and seek. So it's just a beautiful thing that you've invited us to do. I appreciate it. Well, let's move on to, um, Lex, do you want to start with episode 11? Yeah, I I was hoping you could kind of explain how you do in the beginning of this, the reciprocal invitation of the temple and how we not only are taught who Christ is, but also who we can become. What strikes me in the Doctrine and Covenants, if you, uh, the, the Lord is a master of language. Um, when the, the command was given to build the very first temple in Kirtland, Ohio, in section 88, the Lord uses three verbs. He tells them to organize, prepare, and establish. Now, that's clearly something we were to do. We were to organize, we were to establish, or we were to prepare, and we were to establish. But then if you read the dedicatory prayer of section 109, it's brilliant what the Lord does here. He uses those same three words, but he turns around and he says, in the temple, you will be prepared. You will be organized and you will be established. So clearly the Lord is organizing and preparing and establishing. And that was a connection. That was con two dots that connected that really opened up the temple for me is when I realized, wait, we were commanded to do something and then go into the temple and the Lord does the very same thing, those same verbs. So then I began to look at every ordinance, every symbol in the temple as dualistic. Um, take washing, for example. That It's not that he's just going to wash me. It's an invitation for we, me to wash me. And if I wash, then he'll wash. So I organize, be organized. I prepare, be prepared. So if I wash, he will wash me. And all of a sudden I began to realize that every one of those was reciprocal in nature. So if I wash what I think about, he will wash what I see. He will allow me to see marvelous things if I wash what I look at and think about. And every ordinance has that reciprocal nature if you start looking for it. And so in chapter, in, in video 11, where we talk about, I, I jump into Isaiah, and I'm very clear. Let me talk about Isaiah chapter 22. I don't want to tread too, you know, closely to this line. But let me talk about a little episode in the in King Hezekiah's life where his, his servant, the, the one that allows people in to see him, the secretary of state, so to speak, or, you know, the, the chief of staff is unworthy. So clearly he's been letting the wrong people in to see the king or keeping the right people out. And so Isaiah is sent to fire him and to tell the king He's got a new one. His name is Eliakim. And Eliakim, he says, you can trust. And he uses a marvelous phrase that Eliakim is a nail in a sure place. Now, that's, that's right out of the Bible, right out of Isaiah chapter 22, that Eliakim was trustworthy and that you could hang your trust on him. So go ahead and hire him, king. But obviously there's a reference here that Jesus is the servant of the king that lets you in. And the king being the father. And so we're talking about Eliakim, but we're also talking about Christ. And the idea here is that Christ is a nail in a sure place. And that we can trust him. But my point is, in that sacred moment where I am reminded that Jesus is a nail in a sure place, if you look at that sacred moment, there is an invitation for me to be a nail 
in a sure place for him. And I think that's one of the greatest things I get out of the temple is that I want God to trust me. I want God to know that he could call upon me and I'm imperfect and I'm going to make mistakes, but Lord, I'm going to do everything I can. I want to be a nail in a sure place. I want you to be able to trust me like I know I can trust thee. And that's a beautiful moment in the temples. If you look at that reciprocal nature, if you understand that if I organize, I get organized. If I prepare, I get prepared. If I am a nail in a sure place, I want to be a nail in a sure place for him like he is a nail in a sure place for me. And then if you make that connection, if you realize that the moment I'm reminded of that, that Christ is a nail in a sure place, I'm invited to be, there is one other person I share that moment with. And that's a sacred connection, is to realize there is one other, besides Christ, there is one moment, there's one other person I share that moment with. And all of a sudden, a light went off inside me when I realized that. And without any words spoken, I knew what God expected me in terms of being a husband. There is no need to preach a sermon, Lord. Just show me that symbol. And I know what the covenant of marriage is all about. Because he's asking me to be a nail in a sure place for her. And for her to be a nail in a sure place for me. And so I ask myself all the time, am I being someone that she can wholeheartedly trust and hang all her hopes on? Because that's the covenant. When you catch that reciprocal message, you begin to see, I know how to act. I know how to act towards Christ, and I know how to be a husband so that I want to, in every moment, be a nail in a sure place. And I, I, I got very personal in the video, and I stared into the camera and spoke to her. Jennifer, I promise. I'm not perfect and I'm going to make mistakes, but I'm going to do everything in my soul to be a nail in a sure place. And I just, I just, my whole soul wanted to commit to her. One day I, I, I came downstairs and my wife was just weeping and I said, what's wrong? And she just ran over and she hugged me and she kissed me. And I said, what happened? She said, I just watched video 11. <laughs> <laughs> and it just it was one of those moments where i meant every word i i commit to you that i will do all in my power to be someone you can fully trust like i can fully trust christ i just think that is one of the great messages that has come out of the temple for me is to be that kind of child of heavenly parents that kind of disciple of christ and that kind of husband and Father, that I want to be someone that all of those people can hang their trust and their hopes and their, you know, know that I'm going to hold that weight and not let them down. Yes, yeah, so beautiful. I, I just loved and appreciated that so much. And I think it's, it's amazing because we not only learn Christ's character in those moments and in those symbols and come to understand him better and come to trust him more and come to love him more. But we also recognize our potential, you know, and it's such a, <clears throat> I think a healing thing to, if maybe we don't have that sure partner yet or, um, or whatever, like, we can have that relationship with Christ and with our heavenly parents and we can become that person for those that we love and extend that healing and that love and that charity to 
everyone around us. And as we feel it in the temple and come to know it and trust it and recognize it coming from above, then we can take that power and extend it, you know, to those around us. So I just think it's such, I loved how you tied that reciprocal invitation to the temple and it shows, it teaches us so much about who we are and where we come from, who we come from, right? And who we can be. So that was so beautiful. Now, if I may, okay. that's, I think it's so yes. important that when you have that discussion that we go back to video eight and yeah. understand that this whole thing, all of this, the backdrop of the temple is that this life was intended to be a probationary state, that the, the Lord never expected us to be perfected. And, and that's why I yeah. love the symbol of cherubim and the flaming sword is if we understand why that story is told over and over and over again in the setting of making these covenants, I hear the Lord saying, please remember that I don't expect perfection of you. This is a probationary state. And so mm -hmm. I know there's going to, you know, he, I think I hear him saying, I, Bryce, I know you're going to fall. I know you're going to make some mistakes. It doesn't void the covenant, but what I need is, Every time you make a mistake is repent and stand back up. And I think it's important that when we talk about that great symbolism of like video 11, where I want to be a nail in a sure place for my wife, that we all understand that this, this is done. The backdrop of this, all of these ordinances is that idea that we were never expected to be perfect, that this life is in fact a probationary state and that's why I really spent some time talking about that symbolism of what does that mean? What does God really expect of us? What was Satan doing in the Garden of Eden? And why is it significant that he stopped him from carrying out his plan? What does that mean to you and I? I think it's important as we have those discussions to say, look, I, I'm not a perfect husband. I, I make mistakes. Yeah. And that's to be expected but I'm going to do my very best. And that's why we have repentance. And that's why we have an atoning sacrifice. But there was never, ever an expectation of, I expect you to keep these covenant perfectly. Right. And that goes back to we're infants, right? In that process of spiritual rebirth. And it is, it's, it's a messy stumbling, you know, effort that we make, but it, it is, thankfully we do have surety through Christ that we can try again, right? And, and we're not going to talk about all the symbols in this, but if you struggle with perfectionism, if you struggle with feeling like you need to earn salvation, feeling like you never measure up, you're never enough, you're never good enough, that episode, Cherubim and a Flaming Sword, and I think The Veil, I mean, there's a, a several, but specifically that one, and I think The Veil are two of my favorites that Bryce gives that really helps you understand grace helps you understand that you don't have to be perfect. You have to try. As you point out in one of your episodes with uh, on, on Talking Scripture, God doesn't ask nothing of us. He's, get, he's set forth something for us to do, but all he asks is that we try our best to comply with what he's laid out before us. And so go check out those specific episodes. We're not going to talk a lot about those here, but those are awesome if those are specific struggles you're having. One of my favorite episodes of yours was number 14, Health in the Naval. Um, and I've always taken the naval symbol in the temple to just be a belly button or a stomach like you mentioned. So would you explain what this symbol means to you and how it connects us to our heavenly parents? The key is to connect what we do at that moment in the temple with the word of wisdom. You got to open up your doctrine and covenants. And I remind you what gets held up throughout that endowment as if to say, you want to understand what you're doing here, go here. And section 89, word of wisdom, I would suggest is more profound than we as Latter-day Saints often take it. I think there's two levels of the word of wisdom. One is a warning about a conspiracy, and that's verse four, and that's a subject for another day. But in verse three of section 89, it says that the word of wisdom is a, a, a principle with promise. Now, without really stating what the principle is, it states the promise. And I like that. I like that the Lord doesn't give us everything. So at the end of section 89, verse 18, he tells us what the promise is. But he uses a word and again, here's my point. At the very beginning of these temple symbols videos, I point out that 
you've got to learn to see. You've got to pause and learn to see. Well, the same thing as you read the scriptures. I guarantee we've all heard it a hundred, maybe thousands of times, and we haven't paused to hear it. If you obey the word of wisdom, you will have health in your navel. That's the promise of the word of wisdom, health in your navel. And so if you ponder that, I have come to the conclusion, and I just, here's how I see it. That the Lord, the word of wisdom is suggesting that like I had an umbilical cord to my mom, like I was tied to a nourishing parent in the womb, I am still tied to heavenly parents. I have a spiritual umbilical cord, a spiritual navel through which they feed me. Now go to the temple. How am I connected to God as I, pre as I approach him? I'm connected through the navel. We are connected as if that were an umbilical cord through the navel. And then all of a sudden I realized that one thing the word of wisdom is trying to teach is how I take care of my body affects the health and the flow in that navel. I think there's a clear reference to each other, that the temple is trying to point to the word of wisdom and the word of wisdom is trying to point to the temple. I think one of the things mm -hmm. I hear in that and I see in that is that you are connected to God through a spiritual navel if you will take care of your physical body, which is the instrument of your spirit, you will increase the flow of nutrients. Now, if you were to ask the average Latter-day Latter Saint, what is the greatest violation of the word of wisdom? They would probably think in terms of the forbidden items, alcohol, tobacco, yeah. drugs. But if you see it differently, if you connect it this way and say, okay, what would you now say are some of the greatest violations of the word of wisdom? Mistreating your body so that it affects the flow in your navel. Now we say things like, well, I don't sleep enough and I don't feed it the right fuels and I don't, you know, mm -hmm. I don't rest. And, and now all of a sudden it completely changes how I view the connection with, between my body and being fed from heavenly divine sources. And so I really think that there's that connection to, well, I have a hard time feeling the spirit when I'm tired or when I'm really hungry, where I haven't eaten the right things at the right times in the right amounts. And I say right because that's right for me. What does my body need? And I think every body's a little bit different, but I know when I haven't fueled my body with the right things because... I can take the flow of nutrients has been minimized. I control the flow between heavenly sources and myself by how I take care of my physical body. Do I rest it? Do I feed it? Do I, you know, things like uh, get out into the sun? Do I have something to look forward to? Do I interact with people? I am a social being and I need people. So the health of my physical body becomes a major part of my temple covenants, I think at that moment, and I say this to everyone who's been to the temple, isn't that worthy of a constant reminder to put Absolutely. something on me to remember that my physical body is connected to being nourished by heavenly sources? Yeah, I, I think that's so profound and such an essential reminder. It It meant so much to me because you know, I'm pregnant with our fourth baby now. So we've done this a couple of times and just the miracle that it is to grow a life inside you, you know, and when you connected the health of your navel to an umbilical cord, it just resonated so deeply with me of, you know, I don't know a lot about my mother in heaven, but I do know that she's a mother right? That's one of the only things I know about her. And to understand that my body is made in her image, my body can teach me so much about her, you know, in ways that a lot of other things cannot. <laughs> and that process of 
growing a life, you know, it really just manifests the divinity of a mother's love and a woman's body, because really I don't have to consciously think about and try and create and plan how that baby's going to grow inside me. Right. But my divinely created body in her image does that, you know, and it's such a miracle. And it really is so powerful when you know how your body works and that it does supply, you know, that nutrients, that all of the most important things that that baby needs to grow and become. And it also removes, like you say, toxins from the baby. And so that lifeline, which is the umbilical cord connected to our navel, to keep that healthy between us and our heavenly parents, as you say, it is just absolutely essential to our, the, our soul's health, in my opinion, you know. So I just think it's, it's a beautiful symbol. I really loved it. Do you guys mind yeah. if I go on a little bit of a tangent and we kind of depart from the temple symbols videos to just pick up on what you just said, Lexi? That cord flows two directions, not just from mom to baby. Let me read this. I found this years ago, and I studied biology as an undergraduate. When pregnant, the cells of the baby migrate into the mother's bloodstream and then circle back into the baby. It's called fetal maternal microchimerism. For 41 weeks, the cells circulate and merge backward and forward. And after the baby is born, many of these cells stay in the mother's body, leaving a permanent imprint in the mother's tissues bones, brain, and skin, and often stay there for decades. Every single child a mother has thereafter will leave a similar imprint on her baby too, on, excuse me, on her body too. Even if a pregnancy doesn't go full term, or if you have an abortion, these cells still migrate into your bloodstream. Research has shown that if a mother's heart is injured, Fetal cells will rush to the site of the injury and change into different types of cells that specialize in mending the heart. The baby helps repair the mother while the mother builds the baby. Now, let me just build on that. There's this beautiful idea in Isaiah's writings, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10. It says that Christ when he hath made his soul an offering for sin, shall see his seed. Now, I think most of us read when as after. After his suffering, he will go to the spirit world and see his seed. But I think we could read it another way. I think we could read it as if to say, while. I think while is a better interpretation. While he is suffering, he shall see his seed. And I would suggest to all of you that what got Christ through his agony was you. Watching the impact of his atoning sacrifice on your life got him through the agony. And now what gets you through the darkness of your life? He does. Just like that mother, baby, back and forth blessing each other. I need Christ. I need Christ to get through my darkness. But those cells also migrate the other way. And Christ needed me to get through his darkness. That is the relationship I have with Christ. That is the relationship I have with heavenly parents. And that is the relationship a baby has with its mother. And if you understand that we're connected in that way, it opens up so many other beautiful gospel moments. It's beautiful. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that, Bryce. That was a, a beautiful tangent. I want to wrap up here. We have maybe 10, 15 more minutes. I want to wrap up with what was my favorite episode. I mean, it's hard to say a favorite. They're all amazing. <laughs> 
Which child do you love the most, huh? That's right. (laughs) But one of the concepts I I enjoyed the most was in episode 16. I believe the episode uh, is about the, the names that you put on the altar. But it's one of the longest episodes. And most of the episode answers a question that I've been asked and that I've had, which is why do we spend so much time and so much detail in the creation of the world. My mom just asked me the other day, she's like, we spend so much time in the presentation of the endowment. I'm like, I get it. The world was created. (laughs) And Bryce breaks down beautifully the reason why the world was created and why that is so significant to our covenants. So do you want to dive into answering that question? Why the creation of the world over and over and over again? Now, you got to understand, I'm a biologist. My degree, my undergraduate degree was biology. I'm very interested in how the Lord created the earth. I'm very fascinated. And for many years, as I watched the presentation and I read the scriptures, I, I thought he was describing how he created the earth. And I had the same question. Why do I care how the earth was created? What does that have to do with my covenants? Until I read Moses chapter one, the missing first chapter of the Bible and the preceding question. If you read Moses chapter one, the question Moses asks for which the answer is the story of the creation isn't how did you make this? It's a very different question. And that is why? Why did you create the earth? And so I think that we we start every endowment presentation with a reminder as to why we're here. Why did God create an earth? And the answer, long story short, I'll let you watch the video, but the long story short is family. The very first section of the Doctrine and Covenants that was received is section two. And the Lord says, I'm going to send you Elijah to seal those families. And he says, if I don't send Elijah The whole earth will be wasted at his coming. And I really truly believe he was saying, if you don't seal eternal families, the whole earth was Mm -hmm. a waste. The whole earth was a waste if you don't seal eternal families. So the endowment begins with the idea of we were, this earth was created so that we could form families and make them eternal And then one of the last things we do before we go face the Father and account is we we lay these names on an altar, pointing to the book that Joseph said we will present to God, present to Christ in the temple, containing all the records of our dead. And then all of a sudden that becomes a great focus of my life. My life is to save my family, both my immediate and my extended up and down. I'm as concerned about my grandchildren and my great grandchildren as I am about my children. And I should be as concerned about my ancestors as I am about my children. If I am trying to save my family, then I think I've understood why heavenly father made this earth for us so that he could save his family. And that's a very big motivator in my life is, am I doing all that I can do to finish that book so that I can present to the Lord that I've done all that I could to save all of my family, both up and down? That's beautiful. And again, this is a 45 minute video that he just explained in two minutes. So that's just the gist, but you have to get in, you have to watch these and get into the details. Bryce lays out how in the creation story, after every day, God says, in essence, it is good. And not it like, it's amazing, it's excellent. He just, he says, it's good. Pass, check. And then it's not till the seventh day that he says, I believe it's very good. And what was very good, what was different from that last day to the previous days is that he created man. He created husband and wife. The whole point of those first six days of, good, that'll work, that's good, good, yeah, that's good. Ah, very good. We have man. And then to follow up, we, we aren't just told the creation over and over every time we go. We're also told the story of Adam and Eve every time we go. We're told 
why they were there and what their purpose is. And we get to hear the command over and over again, multiply and replenish the earth. That's why we gave you this earth was to multiply and replenish, to build families, to build the eternal family. That's why we're here. And I love the, how, how you point out that Moroni, one of the first things Joseph Smith hears in the restoration, he gets his first vision shortly after he's visited by Moroni. One of the first things he's told in the restoration is he's quoting Malachi, not word for word. He changes a few things, but he quotes Malachi, the last two verses in the Old Testament and says, in essence, we're going to give you the priesthood. And it's going to be so that the hearts of the fathers will turn to their children, the children to their fathers. We are going to connect families. That is why we're here. That is why the priesthood has to be restored. That is why we go to the temples. That is why we make covenants in the temple. We are here to create families. And to build on that, I, as you were explaining that, I don't know if you mentioned it in the video, you might have, but I just thought back to the family proclamation. And this line, it, one of the last lines in that is, we warn the individuals who violate covenants of chastity, who abuse spouse or offspring, or who fail to fulfill family responsibilities will one day stand accountable before God. Further, we warn that the disintegration of the family will bring upon individuals, communities, nations, the calamities foretold by ancient and modern prophets. In essence, it's saying the world will be wasted. It will be a waste if we do not do what this proclamation is laying out, which is the family is the basic unit that God has given us on this earth to fulfill our purposes. The world was created. The purpose of it was for families. And you do a very good job at, at being sensitive to those who are, you know, trying to get married, trying to have children and not being able to, and recognizing that all who keep and make covenants with God will have that opportunity, whether in this life or the next, but not being afraid to say what the purpose is. And that despite the challenges that some of us are going through and how hurtful that doctor might be, that is the doctrine, and that is why we're here. And I would even go so far, Parker, to say, again, this is me. I don't, I don't, I would never point the finger and judge anyone this way. I just, I just look at my life. Going back to that idea that if the if we, if the world lets the family disintegrate, then the calamities are going to come because the world's going to be wasted. I just, I, I honestly hear him saying, and I, I have committed myself to say. If I let my family disintegrate, then mm. my life was a waste. All the things I did instead won't matter because my life was a waste. Now, I know that's a bold statement, but I really do believe it for me is that if I thought something else was more important and spent my time somewhere else and allowed my family to disintegrate, then my life was a waste. I think most men who have gone down that road, even at times me, as I get very preoccupied in my occupation or hobbies or whatever it be, the spirit will tell you that. It's told you that. It's told me that, that if I'm placing anything as a priority above my family, this isn't it. You get chastised from that Holy Ghost telling you, at least me and apparently you, that that's not why you're here. That's not the purpose. Those are good yeah. things, but don't neglect a very good thing in your life. Okay, I, I think that uh, that pretty much wraps up our discussion for today. Do you want to add any other? We have a few more minutes. Do you want to add anything else before we wrap up? I, I ended the series with the symbolism of the water, the healing water. And I would yeah. just leave everyone with my testimony that temples heal. The covenants that we make heal. And I recognize for some people, it's going to take some labor and some effort to get there, to organize their lives, to prepare and establish. But I just wanted everyone to just, I wanted to leave with my witness of the healing power of temples. But I would point out that that healing power is like Naaman. Remember when Naaman comes to Elisha and wants to be healed of leprosy. And he says, go bathe mm -hmm. seven times in the river. And so he walks out and he dips one time. And I'm sure he came up and looked at his hands and didn't see anything changed. 
He didn't say any leprosy gone. It was still there. And the temptation is to walk out of the river because it didn't work. But he didn't. He stayed in the river. He dipped a second time and still no change. He dipped a third time. No change. Sometimes the healing of the temple is a seven dip blessing. And the Lord says, keep going, keep going, keep going. Some people say, well, I don't understand. It's confusing. It's, it, I don't, I don't, I don't get it. Well, keep going mm -hmm. because temples are often seven dip blessings. If you walk out after one dip, you may miss the blessing. But I, I, I witness to everyone with all my soul, I testify of the healing water of the temple. And that if you can come and organize and prepare and establish and get into that, that water will heal you. Thank you, Bryce. I appreciate you sharing your testimony. I appreciate you taking the time and appreciate the time you've put into creating this series. It's already blessed many people's lives. And we wanted to share this specifically with our audience because we want to invite people to go watch that. And then, like you're saying, invite people to get to the temple more often. Uh, I, I can add my testimony to that as well. The more often I go, the more often I'm reminded of those covenants, of those blessings. Of, And it's, it's really, we as human beings, we're so forgetful. We need to be reminded constantly. And so I, I would just add my testimony that the more you go over consistency, over a long period of time, the more you'll love it, the more you'll feel healed by it, and the more it will guide as the Spirit teaches you what's inside of there. Well, I appreciate you, Bryce. Uh, again, links will be in the description below to check out Bryce's uh, channels, check out this amazing temple symbols playlist. He's on video 20. I hope he makes more in the future. I think he's kind of cut it off at 20. Maybe if we shout encore he'll he'll give us some more in the future but definitely go check out what he's created bryce thank you for all you're doing appreciate it you are a true millennial preparing for the savior and preparing all of us keep it up don't ever stop thank you everyone <laughs>